And I am Angela Colatriato. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer for College App Student Loans. We are one of the leading student lenders in the nation. And really, we're dedicated to helping make pe helping people make good choices about whether or not to borrow. And then if they do borrow, making sure that we're giving them financial tools so that they're ultimately successful. And how long has um, College Ab been around? Yes, so College Ab launched in uh, 2014, very, very late 2014. Uh, so we have several years under, under our belt now. Um, and we do lend nationwide. So we work with colleges across the country. Okay, so um, we got that um, going on Facebook if anybody wants to watch there. And um, as I mentioned earlier, I've been working um, with Angela and with College of Student Loans for several years. And I just wanna give them a ton of credit for being willing to help educate families um, about the process, about student loans. Um, I mean, they and we at college at Rhodes College really want to make sure that you have all the information that you need, that people understand the process so that whatever decisions you make, you at least make it with, um, you know, knowledge. Um, and it can be um, a complicated process. And uh, my heart goes out a little bit to the families of seniors because and juniors, you will feel this way next year. It is a long process. Um, hopefully families, and again, if you wanna share, um, if your student has made a decision about where to go um, and uh, you feel like, wow, I've made, my student has made the decision. I've gone, come through a lot and it's just a little bit more to go. And that little bit more to go is to understand loans and to figure out um, if you need to uh, use any of the loans and how the process works. So um, this is kind of the last, stage of the process um, and you can make it and we're going to help you through understanding it. Yes. Okay. And we love what you do here, Debbie. We love the education and the forum that you that you give us to be able to help people. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. So um, let me share my slides and uh, we will officially get going. Okay. And just maybe one or two people, if you can give a thumbs up, let me know that um, you can see the slides. Great, thank you. Oh, oh, wow, that was at the end. Let me scroll all the way to the front. <laughs> Sorry about that. Ah. Okay. Um, so one other fun thing before we get started is again, um, uh, working with College of Student Loans, every year we do some sort of um, a sweepstakes and this year, um, this is for the families with seniors. Uh, uh, we are doing a sweepstakes that um, once a week, uh, if you, whoever enters that week, uh, a winner is, gets pulled and you get a box of cookies, so can, which we, you, you can share with your, you and your student can share as a congratulations to you know, getting to the end of this part of the process. And then in addition, at the end, um, of the sweepstakes, which will be May 15th. Three winners will be picked um, to receive uh, each a $500 gift card to use however you want. Hopefully you'll probably use it towards something related to getting your student to college. So please feel free to um, enter and I will put that into the chat right now. Yeah. And I did personally taste test them so I can vouch for the cookies. They're worth it. <laughs> We'd love to help you celebrate. Okay, so tonight, as I mentioned, we are talking about paying for college and the gender that we're going to go over is to help you understand what the cost of attendance is, because that's an important part of understanding um, how you or what college is going to cost you, different ways of lowering college costs, uh, different sources of where you can get money for college, and then also how do you apply for a student loan? So Angela, can you tell us about the different pieces? First, like what is cost of attendance? And then what are the different pieces that, that it includes? Yes. So talking to families, I, I think uh, many people who are coming in new to the process actually get confused sometimes when they hear cost of attendance and what they really think is tuition. And tuition is just one piece of the cost of attendance. So we'll walk through all of the different components that add up to, to be that total cost of attendance. So tuition and fees are exactly what they sound like and those are billed directly by the school. So that's that direct cost of just attending classes. 
Next is room and board. And obviously, if the student is living on campus, if they're in housing that is controlled by the university, that's going to be billed directly by the school. If they're not living on campus, what would factor into room and board is basically those living expenses like rent, groceries, that type of thing. Um, so think room and board could either be billed directly by the school or it could be basically an allowance for living off campus. And then you have books and supplies, transportation and personal expenses. And um, I do wanna note that under books and supplies, that includes laptops um, and, and electronic necessities like that because really every student needs that at this point. Um, those are not billed directly by the school. They will be somewhat unique to each student, um, but the school will basically calculate, again, kind of an allowance for those categories. And then they will add all of those things together to get to your student's cost of attendance. Now, why is it important to know cost of attendance? Where would people find this information and how do colleges use it? Yes. So they will use your cost of attendance, um, first of all, too, as they're evaluating what is your need. So when they're evaluating what type of aid to provide, they're going to look to your cost of attendance to see what is that total expense that you are trying to cover. Um, on top of that, that will also affect um, how much they will let you borrow. So they will actually, they will actually um, if you decide to apply for a loan, and this would apply to both federal and um, private loans, the cost of attendance will influence how much you can take out because the school won't let you borrow more than their calculated cost of attendance. And you can get that information from their websites. So you can access that information online to understand what that um, total is. So you're not just looking at tuition and fees, but you're really thinking about that total uh, cost for each university. You can get that online from the schools. And the cost of attendance that might be on a website, um, it could it may or may not be an actual family's cost of attendance. And the reason I bring that up, particularly room and board, the college might pick an average room and board um, at their school, but they there might be a range of what you know the different rooms might cost. That's true. So what you will find is going to be, it's going to be an estimate for you. And if you want a better idea for your particular school and for your particular situation, you can absolutely contact uh, your school so that you can get something that is more exact to you. But it is important to note that they are going to factor in a range or an allowance. And if, for example, your student wanted to pick an apartment that was extremely expensive and three times more than what they calculate as their expected range, they would not necessarily allow you to take out funds to cover that if it's exceeding what they're calculating as their anticipated allowance. So it is important to understand, particularly if you think your student might be making decisions that are dramatically different than what would be uh, you know, the average student selection. And so that means if you need to borrow, you're not going to be able to necessarily borrow the funds to cover the more expensive, you know, um, room option as opposed to what might be the average. That's exactly right. So if, um, you know, if that's something that you feel you need to understand in better detail, that is absolutely something that is great to contact the school about to understand what your options are, what your ranges are, um, what that allowance would be if they were going to live off campus. Or to your point, Debbie, there could be different costs depending on the dorm that they select. So even for on-campus housing, there can be uh, differences between uh, what the cost would be for, for different room selections or dorm selections, et cetera. So there's a question about um, what does travel really account for? And that's a good question because that is obviously something that can really range from students depending on where they're traveling from. Yes, so it's primarily back and forth to the school um, for, for your normal commute, as I guess how I would describe it, but there is also a portion, if you're coming from out of state, there is also a portion for um, the expected visits home, I would say. So, you know, if you're out of state, they're not expecting the student to fly home every single month, but they may calculate um, some anticipated expense for, say, typical, you know, winter return, things along that line. And so along this kind of conversation about that the cost of attendance might be a little different, you know, depending on some of the choices that that um, students and families make, can families or students call the financial aid office and say, you know, I might need um, more money allotted for transportation because I'm coming from a further distance than what is in 
the, your estimated transportation. And the reason I'm saying this again, because if they're trying to borrow a little bit more to cover all their costs, is it possible to work with the school to adjust the cost of attendance? I think it's always important to call the school and have that discussion with them. It will probably depend on how far you're talking about exceeding their anticipated ranges. So I would not assume that you would always be able to necessarily negotiate that, but it's certainly the right conversation to have with the school so that you can understand if there is any latitude, depending on where you already fall within their anticipated ranges. Great. Okay. Thought that was an easy topic, but there's a lot to it. <laughs> so, um, Angela, can you tell us, uh, College Ave recently did a survey, which you've done several years, and um, these are just some interesting findings that may or may not make some of the parents feel a little bit better that how, how they're feeling about some of these costs may not be out of line with how other families are feeling. Yes. You're, I think that probably the moral of the story is you're not alone. Um, but I do want to highlight that this was a survey that was conducted with parents of undergraduates who are attending a four-year university. So these are parents who now actually know uh, what costs they're experiencing. And let's really zoom into the top two bars um, because you can see that over half of the parents uh, really felt that both the college tuition and fees as well as the, the room and board, the living expenses were much more than they expected. Um, and I, I, the piece I think I'd really like to highlight, and less so for some of these other categories, the piece I would really highlight is the room and board and the living expenses, because um, the tuition and fees, you're, you're going to know what the, the price is that the college is charging you. The room and board, particularly for the off-campus living, is a great one to research when you're doing your college visits. Talk to students who are actually there particularly if it is a, a city or a town that might not be local to you. So you're not as familiar with what the cost of living looks like in that area. Diving into what those expenses feel like with your, your tour guide or other students that you meet on campus, it can be a great way to research that so that you can get a little bit more real life experience on that one. Yeah, particularly off-campus housing can go in both directions, depending on, you know, where the mm -hmm. college is located. In some places, it's actually it could be less expensive than on campus. In other places, it can be more expensive. And then, of course, um, any type of off-campus housing, you have to some, most likely factor in it's a 12-month lease instead of, um, you know, like maybe the nine-month um, um, monthly, you know, uh, fees that you're paying to the college. Yes. But I think that's one where you have to do a little bit more homework on your own versus the tuition and fee, uh, versus the tuition and fee line to really understand what your expectations should be. And another, just my personal recommendation, if you wanna know, um, you know more firsthand about you know, the rental market or what's, what students are doing for off-campus housing is I would absolutely join the parent group associated, mm -hmm. your fa the Facebook parent group associated with um, your school, student's college. Tons of that information gets exchanged back and forth. Yes, so, also um, a great resource. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's go through some different ways that uh, families can lower the costs of college. Mm -hmm. A lot of these are probably going to apply a little bit more towards the families with uh, still juniors who have the opportunity to do some of these things. But maybe you can shed some um, some some, uh, some some light on some of these suggestions. Sure. So. First, which most people probably have this in there, um, are already thinking about this, that in-state public schools can be great efficient options. Um, and you know, even more so if they really are local to you, that might also give you different living options because perhaps the student could live at home, that type of thing. So between both the, the tuition costs as well as you know, the opportunities they might offer from a living expense um, perspective, you certainly want to have you know, potentially an in-state public school on your, on your list of consideration. Now that said, I also don't rule out private schools just because they're private schools. You may find that they actually offer more substantial merit scholarships or can provide more grants. Um, so you really wanna mix in your applications and in the schools that you're considering so that you can compare all of their offers at the end. Um, definitely, particularly if anything changes after you've completed your FAFSA, you want to make sure that you talk to the university to explain to them how the information that they have on paper about your circumstances on paper um, may not match your current actual state. Um, so particularly if you've had a job change, if you've had unexpected medical bills, um, 
you can modify the information that you submitted to them so that you make sure they have an accurate representation of your ability to pay and they may be able to work with you. Um, there are payment plans available sometimes. Oops, so you just need sorry. to spread. Yes. Is, Angela, before you move off of that one, I just wanted sure. to maybe emphasize that it's um, the changes that, that might happen to a family can happen anytime during the four years. It's not just uh, when they are entering as a, as a freshman. So if something happens with your financial situation in sophomore year, in junior year, they, can, they should definitely um, still be reaching out to the financial aid office to let them know and see what can be done. That's right. Just uh, take that as just a, a rule that anytime that should occur, if it's going to change your ability to pay, you want to talk to the university and see if there's anything additional that they can offer you. Um, you may have a monthly payment plan option so that you could spread those bills out a little bit. Um, and then I want to talk about the next three kind of in tandem, um, starting in a community college, taking dual enrollment classes, taking CLEP, CLEP I can't, can't say it, but taking CLEP exams. Um, the important thing to keep in mind if you're going to pursue any of those options is try to know what your end goal is what university you intend to get your final degree from, because you really want to have a, a mapped out plan and know how those credits, will they count? How will they count? Because what you don't want to do is spend a year taking classes at a community college, um, granted at a, at a lower tuition cost, but then to find out that that's not going to transfer the way that you thought it would or the way you wanted it to for your full four-year degree. And unfortunately, I've heard many, many, many cases where because people didn't have the end goal in mind, they have found that they actually end up transferring and then still need to spend another year, in some cases, sort of repeating classes that they, they feel that they did at the community college. So it can be an absolutely wonderful path, but you just want to make sure that you have discussed and, and have an end goal in mind and have discussed it with the university where you think you intend to land so that you, you're confident in uh, what you select, what you take, and that you're not wasting time or money. Um, the other important thing is it's really good to map out how many credits do you need to take each semester if you want to graduate in four years? And are you on track for that? And if you're not, what does that trajectory look like? Are you on track for a five-year graduation or a six-year graduation? And then take into account that total cost of those extra years, because it will be more than just tuition. It will be living expenses. It will be books and supplies. It will be transportation. Um, so you really want to, again, try to plan ahead and understand how you are mapping as you go. Um, and then finally, don't forget scholarships, because there are um, scholarship opportunities year round. And some people, when they hear scholarships, they naturally assume that, that it means essays or a significant amount of paperwork that they need to submit. And the reality is that there are some that are very quick and easy to apply for. Um, College App actually does a monthly scholarship for $1,000. It's very quick, very easy to enter. Basically sign up with your email address and you get a shot at a $1,000 scholarship every single month. We're not the only ones that do that. So there are simple, easy ways like that uh, to just continue to pursue constantly that extra money for college. So the one um, I also wanted to highlight is uh, you described making sure that students and families understand the number of credits they need to graduate in four years. Mm -hmm. I will say kind of the kind of the opposite in that, that I've met many students who are very proactive and um, manage their credits so that they can graduate in three years. Um, you know, Never. and that's, you know, that's a full year savings. So um, not saying it's for every student, but it's something that, you know, to consider. And again, depending on you know, the suggestions above, if your student is coming in with a certain number of credits, they might be able to manage to yes. um, graduate in three years. And if you're making those plans, it can also help you decide if, you're, if your school offers winter courses, do you want to add a winter course? Do you want to add summer courses? Um, but by mapping that out, you can help make those decisions and then know really what end you're, you're looking at. So I'm just actually scrolling back in, in some of the comments and um, referencing the slide before when we talked about cost of attendance, because somebody had asked about um, the cost for potentially living in a frat or a sorority. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, I actually said to make sure you research that because it could be more, could be less. And just, just I'm just throwing this out at, to other parents if you didn't read the chat, because somebody added that, um, their niece ended up paying more for a sorority mm -hmm. because there are other fees besides just 
the housing, it could be the food, you know, they had, sometimes have a, 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 somebody who cooks. And, and, and so anyhow, just yeah. these are the things that might add up. Plus, of course, you have to decide there's the cost of just being a member of the fraternity or sorority, which um, sometimes are a lot more than parents expect as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. So how should families be using all these numbers? Um, yes. So this is really sort of the entry point to deciding, do you wanna consider borrowing? This is, this is essentially the math you're going to do to, to get to the point where you start to ask that question. So you're gonna take that cost of attendance estimate that you have, you wanna take out the income and savings that you're going to contribute. And so by income, obviously we just mean um, what, you're, what you're able to contribute uh, out of your current earnings, as well as any savings that you have. And then also any scholarships or grants, so free money. If you've got free money that you don't have to pay back, obviously factor that in. And then that's going to tell you what remains, how much is left, and do would you be willing to borrow to cover that? Um, and if you want to entertain that, then you can start to consider your borrowing options. And you will want to do that, obviously, for every single school. By the way, this is the math that you want to do for each school that you're considering. And that's really important what you just said, Angela. Um, it's math that you can estimate, not going to be you know exact numbers, but you can estimate this before your student applies. Mm -hmm. So um, you have a sense of you know where the dollar amounts are going to come in. Um, you know, that may or may not impact whether you want to allow your student to apply, but at least you'll know that information um, and you shouldn't be shocked at the end uh, when your student gets accepted and you do get the, the bills. Yes. So what are the different ways that or sources of money that people use to pay for college? Mm -hmm. So saved money, we really focus on personal savings accounts, um, maybe 529s, they're obviously dedicated college savings, covered LESAs. Um, what I would note here under the saved money that you don't see listed is retirement accounts. We always caution people to be very thoughtful if you're considering taking um, a, a designated retirement account and using that money to pay for college um, because you, you can't borrow to cover retirement in full. Um, there are no loans that are designed to cover the full cost of retirement. There are ways to borrow to pay for college and to share that expense with your student. So there's a reason retirement isn't on this page under the saved money. Um, sometimes it's the right choice for people. There's no judgment. I'm just uh, advising people to be very cautious if you're thinking about going that route. Um, on the free money side, you obviously have funds that come from the college themselves. So merit scholarships or need-based scholarships, but money that's coming directly from the institution. You also have private scholarships. So the scholarship that uh, College Ave runs every month where we give away $1,000, that's an example of a private scholarship that's coming from a private company. Um, and then you also have grants. Uh, the Pell Grant is probably the most common that people are familiar with that is going to be need-based. And then, no. oh, sorry, Debbie. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, then, then you get into borrowed money land, which we're going to go into in detail here. Um, but the, the simple high level way to think about it is federal loans in the student's name, federal loans in the parent's name, or private loans in the student and parent names. Uh, I was just going to answer a question. And just to give this caveat before I do, Angela and I are not, you know, experts in 529s. We, you know, have some knowledge about it, but I, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll share what I know just to, to answer this question. Somebody is asking, can you continue saving in a 529 plan after your child starts at college? So can you continue using the savings for all four years? And, and yes, you can. You can um, continue to put money in a 529 every year your child is in college. In fact, some people, depending on the state that you're in and if you get any tax deductions, um, make a uh, contribution to the 529. Don't, uh, don't, they don't even necessarily have time or they don't leave it there that long, but, and then they use it immediately. Um, but at least they get that, that um, state uh, uh, or the, that federal, uh, or, or sorry, state tax deduction. Mm -hmm. So um, just something to know. And the only other thing I'll add to the different ways of paying for college, and I guess it could have really been under saved money, is, um, of course, you know, um, if there's ways of tightening your, you know, daily budget, you can be pulling money from, you know, your just if you can cash flow, whatever you can from, um, you know, your daily um, income um, 
of course, you know, that's, that's another way. Uh, I mean, it's probably not going to cover everything, but it's just another source. And another source is um, your student uh, getting a job, whether it's uh, through a federal work study that they're offered, or it could just be they can still get a job even if they're not offered federal work study. Um, mm -hmm. And then, of course, they can work during the summer and all that money um, can and probably should be contributing to paying for college. Mm -hmm. So here's um, some more interesting uh, results from the study about how parents uh, are planning to help, help their students pay for college. And I found some of these answers pretty interesting and the order of the answers was interesting. Mm -hmm. And I think the first thing I would note for everyone here is that these numbers don't add up to 100%. And that's because there is rarely one answer that is covering everything. Uh, really every year what parents are doing is putting together puzzle pieces um, to cover the cost. And it often takes several different pieces to be able to cover the full cost. It is ideal to think about your full four-year plan and to plan ahead as much as you can, but just know that uh, it, it does often change year to year and that you do need to often think about all of these ways um, to address those costs. So regular income and, sa and savings is first, certainly the, the main one. And particularly if you were to add in a 529, which is, is really additional savings, you can see that that is the, the lion's share um, and is very common way for people to be funding college. And then you get into grants and scholarships. Um, you'll actually notice that uh, about 37% are taking federal student loans. So that is a, a common way that people are funding college. And then you can see contributions from the student. So the child is going to work, the child is going to have savings that they're going to contribute. Um, you do also notice here, as Debbie mentioned, you know, if you can find other ways to contribute a little bit more through income, you can see that just a little over 20% of parents are actually taking on a side hustle to help offset some of these costs. And then finally, a little less than 20% are using private student loans um, to help close that gap. And then you do have a handful of other smaller options, but those are the most common ways that people are combining and piecing together to cover the full cost of college. And I think what's important, um, Angela and I talked about this earlier and, and you just mentioned it, is that most families are using a combination of these sources. It's, um, and, you know, as you mentioned, it's, it's pieces of a puzzle that they are trying to put together every year. Every year, those puzzle pieces might change or the size of the different puzzle pieces might change but it's really important to try and plan out the four years of where you're gonna get the money from um, and, and not wait until that year is upon you and to say, oh, I'll figure it out then. So here is a, a little bit more inf interesting information from your study about based on how much families had saved um, how much was that covering uh, of the college costs that their students were going to? Yes. So here's here's what I would take away from the, the percent that income and savings will cover. There's no one size fits all. No matter where you might fall in this, you are not alone. Um, you could see that there's a big difference between 26% being able to cover 26% of the cost with uh, your income and savings and being able to cover 100% of the cost with your incoming savings, but there's really a, a very even and wide distribution here across this range. So you're not alone no matter where you are, and there is not a one-size-fits-all or a golden rule of what is going to work for everyone. Um, you can also see that, that yes, you know, one in three do expect the total cost, this would be all you know, four years, um, that they're going to spend more than $100,000 to cover those costs. Um, but again, you can also see that there's quite a distribution across the other ranges. So this is not a one size fits all. There is no one answer here. No matter where you sit in this, you are not alone. And, and you have other people that are also trying to um, answer these questions in the same way that you are. Well, what I feel is also important, and it's kind of not directly um, said in the slide, but this is also where uh, the idea of figuring out what your family's budget comes mm -hmm. into play. And we're going to talk a little bit about EFC, and that's changing its name to mm -hmm. SAI, which will tell you what that stands for. But so there's what the college expects you to pay, and there's also what your family has budgeted. Yes. And those numbers probably aren't going to be the same. But if you know those numbers ahead of time, you can work towards 
um, you know, fulfilling them. And I just share this one story because I, I kind of I thought it was a great story. It was a, um, a parent in our Facebook group, Paying for College 101, who had four kids and she actually, their family must have had a decent income because uh, she knew her EFC was over 80,000. So an EFC of over 80,000, she was not going to get aid anywhere. She, her student could get merit probably if they applied to the right school, but she had four students that you know, four kids that she had to put through college. And so she basically said, it doesn't matter that my EFC is 80,000. My budget is 30,000 per child. Right. And she worked it, not saying it was easy. She worked it. And by strategically applying to schools, her student was able to find a school that, that could net 30,000. But so she actively knew her budget. She obviously knew her EFC. And then with that information, she could um, you know, research the colleges and strategically put together a college list that her student could apply to, and then they could have choices. Um, but again, that's the importance of knowing this information almost before the process starts. Yes. So what are the different types of financial aid applications that some parents here have probably all already filled out, but others are going to be lucky enough to encounter in the next year? Yes, we'll give a we'll give a preview for the juniors and a reminder for the the senior parents because they will not be one and done on these. Um, so the first big one is the FAFSA. That is um, the federal form, the free application for federal student aid. Um, it is free. It is accessible at studentaid.gov. Um, and I really want to highlight here the required by most colleges and universities because if you want to raise your hand for any type of aid at these institutions, and that includes merit, if you wanna raise your hand for any kind of aid, you have to submit the FAFSA. Um, and we'll, we'll go a bit more into some of the uh, things that you can access by completing it, but just please note that, and you do complete it every year. So every year your child is in school, you need to do it again. Um, and then you would often get links as you're completing it. You, you may access the state grant links at the end of it. Um, there's also the CSS profile. So this is fee-based. I believe it's $25 for the first school and then maybe $16. It's a lesser amount for every school thereafter. Um, CSSprofile.org is the website. It is only required by a subset of colleges and universities. So um, your college will probably make it very apparent if this is a form that you need to complete for them. But if you uh, want to research that on your own, you can access their site and you can look up whether or not your school is going to require it. There are differences in the information that is requested on the CSS profile versus the FAFSA, and there are differences in the calculations that occur after you submit these forms. Um, but you do need to understand, I would assume, I would just assume you need to do the FAFSA, and then you need to do your research to find out if you need to do the CSS profile for your schools. And then finally, some schools will have their own custom institutional applications. Um, that's something that you would find out about directly from the individual schools. Um, I don't know, Debbie, you may know more on this one. I don't know that this is terribly common, but it certainly does exist and you would wanna know if your it school- is a handful. If it applied. Um, I just wanna address uh, that somebody is saying, uh, you know, the FAFSA, didn't necessarily matter that much, or they were disappointed in the outcome. Um, and I would say yes and no. Of course, a lot of people are disappointed in what their EFC is. It's probably 100%, you know, um, across the board, a disappointment. But in terms of whether the FAFSA mattered, um, it may or may not have mattered in terms of your family being able to get aid. But where it does matter is that if your student or you as a parent want to borrow any federal funds, mm -hmm. you have to fill out the FAFSA. And if your family needs to borrow anything, and we'll kind of get to that, um, you, your student should be absolutely uh, maxing out federal student loans first. The only way they're going to be able to access that money is through um, having filled out a FAFSA. The only way you as a parent could potentially uh, get access to a Parent PLUS loan is if you fill out a FAFSA. So. You know, that's really in some for most families why it matters the most. Mm -hmm. And, and that the merit piece is really important too, because most people don't, they do think about it only from a I'm not going to qualify for need-based aid, so I shouldn't fill that out. Or maybe I don't think I'm going to borrow, so I don't need to fill that out. But you certainly want to be eligible for any type of merit that your student might be able to receive. So there's just no reason not to do it. 
So you should absolutely complete the FAFSA every single year because of the doorways that it could open. And lastly, about the, you know, the doorways that it could open, um, in terms of borrowing, again, for your student or for you as a parent, uh, it, there, there are no income restrictions. So, mm -hmm. you know, I like to say, and probably it's not the case, but you could be making a million dollars and um, you still are eligible and your student particularly is eligible to um, borrow that money. So um, again, if, if there's any borrowing that your family needs to do, that's um, the major reason why you should be filling out the FAFSA. Yes, that's exactly right. So what is the student aid index? What is it replacing? This is all new for all of us this coming year. It is. So there are some fairly significant changes coming to FAFSA this year. And I know there were some questions about when it opens. It usually opens in October. I think there is a chance this year that it may get delayed because of these changes. So for those of you um, who need to fill this out in the upcoming fall, um, keep an eye on that news because it, it may not open in October this year because of the changes that are coming. So you'll want to keep an eye on that. Um, so FAFSA, once you've submitted your information, there is basically a math formula that happens behind the scenes and you'll get the output. The old name for it was your expected family contribution. The new name for it is the student aid index. I actually think that this is a really great change. Um, because the expected family contribution, I, I believe it set the wrong expectations. What the number really is that you're getting out of the FAFSA formula, it, it's, it's giving the school information that they will then look at where you sit relative to the other applicants in their pool. So it really, it, it helps them to figure out where you sit on the index. It does not mean that if you get that number back, that's exactly what you're going to pay. It doesn't mean that it's what the school has to charge you for the education. It's, it's not a dollar amount that, um, it's just going to give you an idea of sort of where you fall. It's not really a number that says, this is what you will pay. And it, the, there's some key differences that are happening in the formula. So household size is not going to be included. Um, it will not take into account whether or not you have multiple students in college at the same time. Um, there are some changes around untaxed income and there's some changes to income protection allowance. And what the income protection allowance really is, is essentially the minimum um, cost of living that they would assign to any given family. So there are some changes to how they are calculating those pieces. It's, it's a little hard to say at this point what the average change is going to be because we it's not implemented yet. So we haven't actually seen it. So we just wanted to give heads up mm -hmm. um, to families about this, uh, particularly families with juniors. Probably in the coming months, we will have a lot more detail about the specifics of um, how the formula changes and who it's truly impacting. There were some comments that uh, this these changes are not going into effect until December 1st. Uh, so that yes and no in that um, technically the government system isn't going to be live now until December 1st. So that's absolutely true. I don't honestly have the answer to how colleges are going to handle that before December 1st because they obviously have early admissions. And I think a lot of colleges are figuring that out right now. So um you know, there, there may be something that still needs to be filled out uh, and might be college specific before December 1st, um, if your student's applying for the early admission. So it's a little bit all up in the air. It will be a very interesting summer as more of this information comes together. Um, but, the, you know, this is on the horizon. I cross my fingers and hope that what the government was trying to do was truly simplify the process of getting the FAFSA done. And part of that is that the systems between the um, IRS and the, um, you know, the student um, aid the, uh, systems are now will be talking to each other. And that will be the only way the information is transferred. Mm -hmm. So um, that, sh that it should be a major simplification. Debbie, I do see a lot of people asking questions about which tax year you use. It's actually the prior prior. So when you fill it out in 23, you're actually using your tax returns from two years ago. That reaches back to that conversation that we had in the beginning that if your circumstances have changed, 
since the numbers you're going to use to fill in that form, if your circumstances have changed, you can follow up with the school to give them your more updated information. But the FAFSA actually uses the prior prior year uh, for tax information. That's literally how they refer to it. I didn't make up prior prior. <laughs> Oh, yeah. If we were making up the labels and names for a lot of these things, we would hopefully do a much better job. But that's another conversation. <laughs> yes. So um, we're now at the point of talking more about loans. Um, Angela, can you definitely tell people what the different loan options are for students and parents? Yes. So let's talk federal first. Um, the federal direct loans are federal loans in the student's name. Those are the ones that you always want to, if you need to borrow, you want to take the federal direct loans in the student's name first. They're always going to have the lowest fixed rates that you can get. They do have a number of um, repayment protections, such as income-based repayment, that type of thing, a number of protections from the government. Um, there are borrowing caps, which is why you may need to explore other options, and we'll talk more about that. Um, and there's no credit check. The other piece I would add here that's not explicitly on this page, but that we have mentioned is though they're not need-based. So it doesn't matter what income you have, as long as you have cost of attendance that you need to cover, most students qualify for those loans. Um, now, once you hit those caps, which again, we'll go into what those are, that's when you start to consider parent plus loans or private loans. So parent plus loans come with an origination fee um, that is higher. There is actually an origination fee on the direct loans too, but it's it's lower. Um, there is a origination fee on the parent plus loan. Um, there are some protections. They are somewhat similar, I would say, to the student loans in terms of the income-based repayment options, that type of thing. There's no borrowing cap. So you can borrow up to the cost of attendance. If you need to close that gap, you can borrow up to the cost of attendance with a parent plus loan. Yes, students can get federal loans for undergrad in their name. That's the direct loan. Um, and there is only basic credit check on the Parent PLUS loan. So you will need to pass some credit check. There is no credit check on the student version, but on the parent version, they will do a basic credit check. But they are looking for things like, did you have federal student loans in the past that you did not repay? There are only a few basic uh, criteria that you would need to pass to be eligible for it. There's a question about, um, are there prepayment penalties on the federal loans? I do not believe so. I don't think they are either. Yeah. I would recommend you verify that at studentaid.gov, but I do not believe so. In fact, sometimes families take out the loan at the beginning of the year, not quite sure what um, their needs are going to be for the rest of the year, yes. they figure out that they had the money and then they um, prepay the, the federal loan. That's right. And what you do need to, what you, what I would say on the Parent PLUS loan, and then I'll, I'll move into the private loan comparison, what you need to think about if you're considering a Parent PLUS loan is really that there is a very limited credit check. So you need to think about your comfort level with taking on that debt and whether you will be able to repay it. The student's name is not on it. You are entirely legally responsible for it. And the government is not really assessing your ability to repay that loan. Um, you need to make that assessment because the, as I mentioned, the credit check on it is, is very basic. So the expectation is that you as the borrower are deciding whether or not you can handle that parent plus loan. So that's what you need to think about if you're considering borrowing there, as well as the origination fees and the interest rates. Usually once people start considering plus, did you do you want to wait and go into plus and private? Yeah. Is that okay? that. Yeah. That's fine. Let's go deeper into the subsidized the I'm sorry, let's go deeper into the direct loans right now. There's two flavors of the direct loans. And remember, both of these direct loans are in the student's name only. So these are both for the student only. The subsidized loans are the smaller subset. These are need-based. So you will only be eligible for a subsidized loan based on need. So income will come into play here, as well as how much you, um, what your estimated need is at the individual institution. 
Um, on a subsidized loan, what makes it subsidized is that the interest, it doesn't get charged while the student is in school. So they only start accruing interest after they drop below half time or, or graduate, um, but they only start accruing interest essentially after they're out of school. Um, and individual schools are going to communicate to you if you qualify for this and if so, the amount. And because it does depend on your need as well as your need at that school, you may receive different offers. So one school might offer you a subsidized loan or a different amount of a subsidized loan, and you may receive a different offer from a different school. It doesn't necessarily mean you'll get the same offer from every school. The unsubsidized loans are the most common. This is what is available to virtually everyone who completes the FAFSA. Um, the interest does start accruing right away when the money is issued and it continues to accrue while they're in school and through the life of the loan. Um, again, not need-based, open to virtually everyone. Uh, it, there is a, a little bit of a caveat here that if you're a dependent student, and this really has more to do with the limits that we're going to get into next, but in some cases, uh, you can get uh, incremental unsubsidized funds if you qualify, uh, if your parents are not eligible for PLUS loans. Um, it's not, I, I would say that's a less common scenario, so we probably won't go deeper into it than that, but just keep in mind that if for some reason the parent doesn't qualify for a PLUS loan, the student may be eligible for more from an unsubsidized loan perspective. So why, Angela, would um, the same student get offered subsidized loans at one school and not subsidized loans at another school? Again, it depends on your need at that school. So where do you fall on the index? What are you getting? And what is your need at that institution? And so that's why the numbers of what the school's cost of attendance and what your this right now EFC is, or you know, could in the future SA, SAI is going to be. Um, that's where it comes to into play. So um, at a school with a higher cost of attendance, you might have a need, a financial need, and your student might be offered subsidized loans. Mm -hmm. At a school with a lower cost of attendance, you might not have the same need, and that's why um, you wouldn't get subsidized loans. So we see that a lot, where people kind of wonder why. Did my student get some subsidized loan here and yes. not at another school? Yes. So these are the limits that I discussed. And, and these limits are the reason why if uh, a student will often need more than just the direct loan. Um, so you can see that it changes by year in school. So let's really talk about freshmen as an example. Um, the average freshman can only borrow $5,500. And I, I'm really going to focus on that dependent undergraduate column because it is it is a very uncommon for people to be independent undergraduates. If you think that that scenario applies to you, I would encourage you to go investigate it at studentaid.gov. But the vast majority of undergraduates are considered dependents. And so they will fall under these uh, restrictions in terms of their, their annual loan amounts. If they qualify for a subsidized loan, only a portion of that, let's just take freshmen, only a portion of the 5,500 can be subsidized. So there's actually a $3,500 limit on the subsidized loan. The 5,500 is the, the maximum if you're talking about the unsubsidized. And you could have, you, that could be split. You could have 3,500 in subsidized and the remainder in unsub. Um, that's how to think about that. The subsidized could only be a subset of those loan amounts if you qualify for that. And then you can see that you can borrow a little more each year. So once you qualify as a sophomore based on your credits, you could borrow $6,500 for that year. As a junior, you could borrow $7,500. And again, as a senior, $7,500. Um, and there is a lifetime limit to how much you can borrow under the direct loans. And I do just want to underline again, these are in the student's name only. These are not need-based and they are in the student's name only. So this is what they can get on their own without any additional help and without you taking on any debt without as a parent. That's why these loans, again, if you are borrowing are so important. These are the first loans that students um, should be taking out. They should be maxing these out every year if they need to borrow. And the other thing that's really important about the um, federal direct loans is that you have to take it in the year that it's offered. So if for whatever reason, your student doesn't take the 5,500 freshman year and it comes to sophomore and they need more than the 6,500, you cannot go to the government and say, I didn't borrow freshman year. I'd like to 
you know, use that money now. It is only offered in the year that your student is in at college. Um, and again, back to the comment I made earlier, that is a reason why sometimes families and students take out the loan, not really knowing if they need it, but at least they um, can use the money, decide if they want to pay it back because they know that they won't be able to access that particular dollar amount in later years. That's right. And that is why we keep stressing, have at least a, a high level plan for the full four years, because you don't want to get to junior year and realize that you really wish you took a freshman or a sophomore loan because you can't go back and reaccess that money. Um, and I know somebody asked, why is the lifetime max more than all four years? Because you may not graduate in four, you may be a senior for an additional year or an additional year. Um, and that $7,500 limit would apply up to the lifetime max. So, um, Angela, can you talk a little bit about the interest rates on um, the federal direct loans, when we're going to know what this coming year's interest rates are? Sure. So the interest rate actually resets every year on July 1st. Um, they will communicate what the interest rate is going to be set at. It, usually the news comes out late May. Um, so you will be able to find the information in the news, but the government website does not usually update until July 1st for what the rates will be for the upcoming year. Um, you can see that right now it, it is at 499, and these are all fixed rates, by the way. So it's at 499 fixed and it has the origination fee of um, just over 1%. And that origination fee actually just gets rolled into your loan amount. So it's just, it's it's a piece of the loan. It Like as a freshman, as an example, if you're taking out that maximum of 5,500, the, the fee has to be a piece of, the 5,500 because it is just a, it's a component of the loan. It's rolled together. So you won't get the full 5,500 that Correct. gets applied to, um, you know, your bill. You'll get the 5,500 minus the origination fee. That's correct. Um, and so I would just encourage everybody to keep an eye out in the news late May-ish uh, for the, what the rates will be set at this year. And those will be effective as of July 1st. But there you, they are, Based on is the ten year T bill it rate? Is. It is. It, it's a sale from a particular day in May, and I just can't remember exactly which day in May it gets set. But I know that the news generally comes out late May. That's correct, though. And I, in terms of interest rates that you can get in the market, it will be a lower interest rate than you could get, you know, likely anywhere else. That's why we always say go here first, borrow this first if you need to borrow. So just to summarize, the reason again why the um, federal direct student loans are so important uh, for students. They are probably the only loans that they'll be able to get solely in their name without a cosigner. And they will probably be at the lowest interest rate possible of any loan that's out there. Yes, that's exactly right. And they do change every year. So if you borrow for freshman year, you're going to get the rate that is set the July 1st before your freshman year begins. For sophomore year, for the next loan that you take, you will get the rate that is set for July 1st before your sophomore year for that loan. Now, the loan that you took freshman year will remain at the interest rate it is fixed. So that particular loan that you took for freshman year, the interest rate on that loan won't change. But if you take out one for sophomore year, it will be set on the new rate that is in place for July 1st before your sophomore year. So if your student ends up taking out um, a federal direct loan for every year for four years, they will, they are technically separate individual loans Correct. and they will have different interest rates. That's right. And just to clarify, somebody said, um, I thought you said that the, the um, subsidized loans have a zero interest rate. So maybe you, just to explain what um, we're talking about an interest rate now and what, and but we also said subsidized loans aren't charged an interest rate. Subsidized loans, you're not charged interest during school. So they do have an interest rate and interest will eventually be charged on that loan. But while the student is enrolled at least half time, you won't be charged interest on a subsidized loan. The unsubsidized will begin to accrue interest immediately as soon as the money is sent to the school. But so once both that of them student... have an interest rate, it's just a matter of interest not being charged on the subsidized during school. Right. So once that student graduates, um, that subsidized loan will be start, it will have an interest rate that it will be charged. And it will be whatever the interest rate was of that loan in the year that that they um they took it out. That's right. Okay, so parent plus loan. 
tell us more about what this is um, and you know the important features that pe parents need to know about it. Yes, so the Parent PLUS loan, um, and keep some of these points in mind because I'm gonna compare and contrast with a private parent loan. Um, for the PLUS loan, it does need to be a parent who takes the loan. There are some rules around guardianship, et cetera, but it really needs to be a parent. Um, in general, other relatives or other non-relatives cannot access the loan. Um, it's not in the student's name at all. The student is not on the hook for the debt. The student is not liable for the debt. The parent is completely responsible for the loan. Um, and generally, the loan cannot be transferred to the student. Occasionally, different companies, um, private companies will let you refinance and transfer the debt, but um, I wouldn't necessarily rely on that 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 will be an option. It is a, uh, it may or may not be available for you to find a way to transfer that debt legally to the student. Sometimes we certainly hear that people make an agreement that although the parent is taking on the debt, the student intends to repay it, but just remember it's going to show up on your credit bureau from a legal perspective, you will be completely responsible for it. And the way you apply is by submitting the FAFSA. Um, it also has a fixed rate. Um, Debbie has those on the screen for you. Uh, and again, it also will reset on July 1st in the same way that the direct loans that we discussed will. Um, there is no cap. So you're not subject to that. You know, for a freshman, you can only get $5,500. You're not subject to that. You can take a plus loan all the way up to the cost of attendance that the school has set for the student, um, minus any other financial aid received. So if the, if the school gave you a scholarship, they're going to look at your cost of attendance. They're going to subtract the scholarship they gave you, and then they'll let you, you know, borrow the remaining amount. Um, and there is a higher origination fee on these than there is on the direct loans that we discussed. The, di the director are a little over 1%. This is actually over a 4% origination fee. Um, and again, that will be just tacked on to the loan. It will be a piece of the loan. Um, and so you will repay that as part of the loan. So you actually pay interest on the fee because you're repaying it as part of the loan. Uh, that fee can, can really make a difference in terms of the cost. So it really is important to do that math and, and how much you're gonna be paying in terms of the origination fee, particularly if you start to shop other options. And every year you take out a Parent PLUS loan, you um, are charged the origination fee. It's not just the first year that you yes. take it out. And those fees reset as well, weirdly, the interest rates reset on July 1st and the fees reset, I believe in October. Mm -hmm. So just make sure you know what the current one is when you, if you elect to borrow, make sure you know what the, the correct rate is for the loan that you're taking. And again, the rate that um, we have on the screen, 7.54 is current rate. Um, it will change. Unfortunately, it probably it will be higher just based on the um, interest rate environment that's going on right now, uh, but we don't know what the exact number will be. Yes, that's right. Somebody had asked about um, if parents are divorced, can each parent take out a Parent PLUS loan? Yes, as long as it's a parent, absolutely. And this is something you might want to, again, plan. It could be that one year one parent takes out the Parent PLUS loan in their name and another year, a different parent does. Um, again, this is like part of thinking through the four years of how to pay for college. <clears throat> yes. Uh, uh, good question. Um, you're probably not gonna like the answer to this. Jennifer is asking, are these loans affected if a parent is still paying their own student loans? There is so as long as your loans are in good standing. So if you have your own federal student loans and you'd like to take a plus loan, as long as you've been making payments on your own loans and those are in good standing, then yes, you are eligible for a plus loan. Again, that is where I would really encourage people that if you're considering this option, there are very few limitations on it. So you have to really be thoughtful about whether or not you can afford to take on this loan because. The credit check that happens on the government side is um, it's minimal. So they are really not making an assessment of whether or not you can repay this loan. So you have to make sure you do that math, but they won't stop you from having your own loans and a plus loan. Another good question here is somebody's asking, does it matter who fills out the FAFSA um, if you know a different parent's going to take out the parent plus loan? 
That's a great question. I believe because of the way that they're tied together, I, I believe that the parent who wants to take the PLUS loan would need to complete the FAFSA. I, I um, agree. I think so too. I don't know 100%, but that's my logic is that um, because the parent PLUS loan is tied to the FAFSA. Yeah. So um, the person who is ultimately going to take out the parent PLUS loan is probably should be the parent who um, you know gets the the FSA ID and, and does the, the FAFSA. I will just caution that that's a specific scenario. So I would recommend that you go to studentaid.gov and do your research on that. And, and um, don't just take this word for it. I would definitely verify at studentaid.gov to be certain. Okay, so we've kind of talked through the um, federal loans for students, the Parent PLUS loan, now tell us more about the different types of pro private loans. Sure. So usually once people start considering PLUS, that's when private should come into the conversation and you should at least entertain it to understand what might be the best option for you. And one of the first um, gates that we typically see people go through is, do I really want this loan only in my name or do I want the student to also have skin in the game on this loan? And that might be a reason why you would want to consider the private student loan options because private student loans are typically not only in the name of the student. Students just simply don't have the credit history or the income to qualify to borrow on their own from a private lender. They often need a cosigner that is often a parent. It doesn't have to be a parent. It could be another credit worthy adult. So if you have an aunt or if you have somebody else who is a credit worthy adult, who wants to co-sign the loan, that's okay. But it is usually gonna to need to be the student with an adult who has an established credit history and income. Um, a, much like the PLUS or just like the PLUS, you can borrow up to the full cost of attendance with a private student loan. Um, interest rates are based on the credit profile for the, for the most part. Um, so if you have stronger credit, and when I say you, it is often that cosigner because they're the ones that are really bringing that credit history to the table. If the cosigner has stronger credit, there will be a lower interest rate. Um, I'm actually going to come back to the cosigner release piece, but um, unlike federal loans, origination fees are not common in the private student loan space. So that again is why if you're making that comparison, you want to understand what you're paying on that PLUS loan because you are almost definitely not paying an origination fee on the private side. I, I don't know of anybody that's charging that right now. Um, and you do also want to think about cosigner release. So that is a different animal in this type of product versus um, probably any other product you've ever heard of. If you've ever had tried to be removed from a mortgage, you know that if there's two people on the loan, it is almost impossible to pull one of those people off. Student loans are a little bit unique in this sense because lenders do recognize that the parent is initially or the cosigner is initially signing on to help that student get the degree, get the job, and then it's often the student who's largely responsible. So many, many lenders do have a way to release cosigners once we can confidently see that the student can stand on their own. Um, not all lenders offer it. So if that's important to you that you think you're going to want to get off that loan before it's fully repaid, uh, you do want to double check whether the lender offers it because they don't have to and they don't all offer it. And then the, people have different criteria. And what I would encourage you to do if, if it's important to you is look at that criteria and see how easy it is to understand. Do you clearly know what you have to do to be approved for the release? Or is it a black box? where they're saying you can ask for it and then we'll do a review and we'll tell you whether or not you qualify, but we're not gonna tell you what we're looking for. Because if it's a black box, you don't know what has to be accomplished to be approved for the release. So look for whether or not they offer it and look for transparency of criteria. What will you need to do to make sure that you be approved to get released from the loan? Um, and then finally, it is really important to discuss with your student how interest rates work. And really that doesn't just apply to private student loans, by the way, that just applies to borrowing. It's incredibly important that your student understand how interest rate works, who's repaying it, um, what the monthly payments are going to look like, whether they're borrowing federal or private. That's a conversation that needs to be had if money is, if, is being borrowed. And can you 
describe a little bit about what a private parent loan is yes. and how it differs from a private student loan. Yes. So we call these parent loans in part because it just helps people understand what they are comparable to, that they are in many ways comparable to PLUS. However, it's, it's maybe more better said on the private side as a sponsor loan. You don't have to be a parent. So there aren't as many restrictions about who can take out a private parent loan. It is still only in that, um, I'm going to call it a credit worthy adult. It's still only in their name. If you're taking out a private parent loan, the student is not on the loan. They are not responsible for them. They don't show on their credit bureau. They're not legally obligated to repay them. Um, so that's very much like that, that plus loan is just that a, a wider group of people can qualify for them versus just the parents. Um, again, you can borrow up to the full co cost of attendance with these. You don't have origination fees. So you're not paying that 4% plus fee on top of what you're borrowing. Um, and they can often be better if you really are thinking, I'm comfortable taking out the debt on my own. I want this in my own name. I don't want the student on. It's a great idea to shop the private parent loans because you're not paying an origination fee and the rates are gonna be credit-based. So if you have strong credit, there's a good chance that you could qualify for a lower interest rate in the private space versus on the PLUS loan. So strong credit, no origination fee, that should be in the mix if you're thinking about um, taking a loan out only in your own name. Angela, can you talk a little bit about interest rates? Is, can you give a sense of what the range of interest rates are? Maybe, you know, you can probably only talk um, really specifically about college Ave student loans and how those interest rates um, are set. Yes. So the interest rates are based on essentially what it's costing us as lenders to be able to extend the money. So in this rising rate environment where you're seeing car loans go up and credit card rates go up, student loan rates are inching up as well because it, it's costing lenders more money to be able to make the loan. So that does get passed along. Um, the interest rates right now, I think the fixed rates are somewhere between call it five and 13 which is a fairly big range. And part of that is that there are often different interest rates, first of all, based on credit. So stronger credit is gonna get a lower interest rate. Uh, but then secondarily, we also offer different interest rates depending on what repayment options you pick. So if you choose to start making payments in school, if you commit to that and you pick an in-school repayment option, you will get a lower interest rate than if you defer all the way until after graduation. We do offer that deferred option, but the interest rate will be higher than if you start making some form of payment right away. We also offer a choice of repayment terms, how long you're taking to pay back that loan. If you're taking out the loan for five years, it's going to be a lower interest rate than if you're taking out the loan for 15 years. And it really all comes back again to the risk that the lender is taking and the cost of that the lender has to pay to extend money based on what those current market conditions are. So there's a question maybe just to reiterate, about the private parent loan. Um, is it or is it not only limited to parents? It's not only limited to parents. Well, college abs is not, and there are certainly others that are like that. Double check, any given lender could theoretically restrict you to that, but in general, in the private space, those loans are not restricted to just parents. So in the private space in general, even a, a cosigner is usually not restricted to a parent. It, these are- It's not. It, these are basically, they can be in theory, any credit worthy adult. That's absolutely right. I'm not, you know, sometimes yeah. I've, I've worked with families where it has to be, or attend, it might be an aunt or an uncle or yes. a grandparent. Yes. Um, so there are other options. There are absolutely. Parents are what we see most often, but it's, it's absolutely not required. It can be a different credit worthy adult. So you started to touch on the other features of loans, but maybe you can kind of quickly go through it. And these are um, features that you should, you know, as parents and families understand. And ultimately, when you're looking at different lenders and loans, you should compare these different features. They're not all going to be the same for every lender. That's right. So cosigner release, I think we already hit in detail. Do they have it? How clear is it what I need to do to get there? Uh, interest rates look at the interest rates and look for any discounts. So automatic payment discounts are fairly common in the space. Um, if you will sign up to have your payments be made automatically, you can usually get something like a, a 0.25 discount on your interest rate for that automatic enrollment. Um, repayment options and loan terms. So this is some, I started to touch on this. 
you may be able to get a lower interest rate if you make a commitment to pay while the student is in school. And when I say that, it could be full payments. Maybe you start making full payments right away. It could be just the interest. That's another option that, that College Ave offers. Um, it could be, we also offer just pay $25 a month while the student is in school. Every one of those will have a, a you know an incentive for you to pay a little bit more during school. We'll pass that benefit on to you. Um, again, shorter loan terms. We have lower interest rates if you're borrowing the money for a shorter period of time. Um, these are, I'm speaking really specifically right now to some of College Ab's features and the, the flexibility that we've tried to build into our loans so that you can match the loan to your budget and your goals and, and not pay any more than you really have to. Um, if you are investigating other lenders, they may or may not do some of the things that I'm describing. So that's why it is important to shop around because if it's a private lender, they can set you know different benefits, different features on their loans. Um, some of them may let you choose a repayment term like we do. They'll let you choose how long you take to repay. Some of them will not let you choose. Some of them will assign it. Um, so those are all of the different things you're going to want to investigate. And if it's important to you to spread those payments out over a longer period of time, even of the ones that offer you the choice of your terms, some may offer longer terms than others. So <clears throat> those are the things you'll want to investigate with a variety of lenders. If you, knowing what's important to you, what's important is to zero in on what's important to you. Do you need to manage <coughs> monthly payment? Are you trying to manage to the total, the lowest total cost? Um, you know, what, what pieces are most important for your student and for you? And a lot of times, a lot of lenders, and I know particularly College Ave has this on their website, where you can honestly kind of, they have um, tools where you can fool around with the different features. So you can um, say, what will, it, what will my monthly payment be if I um, pay the loan back in 10 years? What will it be if I pay the loan back in five years? What will it be if I start repaying it while my student's in college? Um, so and I encourage you, again, if you're going down this route, to, to look at all of those changes that happen when you um, choose different options, whether it's the how long you're going to take to pay it back or how quickly you're going to start. Um, oh, Debbie, you're on mute. <laughs> I muted myself while I was trying to mute somebody else. <laughs> Um, but um, ultimately, all these numbers, you know, again, of, of the features impact your monthly payment amount, and it impacts what the total cost of borrowing is, which is really important to factor in the total cost of borrowing um, adds into what the total cost is going to be to send your child to, to college. And I've seen a few questions with, with a similar flavor here. So let me just address Anything in student loans happens every single year individually. So you don't set the interest rate for four years. You don't borrow for four years. You, you need to go through the process every single year. And then you can usually borrow for either a semester or an academic year at a time. So if you do a semester at a time, you're coming back two or three times a year, depending on how your school is set up. If you do an academic year at a time, you're coming back once a year. But that's true on the federal side and it's true on the private side. The process repeats every year that your student is in school and you will have multiple loans and they will have different interest rates assigned based on the point in time when you took that loan out. So there's a good question um, that's asking, how do you know then every year if you're going to be approved? Yes. And for so, how much? So we actually have what we call our multi-year peace of mind. Um, and what we have found that is that um, I think it's upwards of 97%. It's, it's on our website that if we approve you for that first loan, you can rest assured that when you come back and apply with us again, you're going to be approved for your next, your next you know, loans that you need to get through school. So we have vetted that in our data that we can, we can make that promise. So here are a few more features that um, people should probably know about related to the loans. Yes, so prepayment penalties are not common in private student loans. We get that question a lot. I think it's because people's frame of reference is mortgage, um, but prepayment penalties are not common. Always good to double check. Lenders in theory could put them on there, but not common. 
Um, hardships, this is a great question of, you know, what programs do you have available if we're having trouble repaying the loan? Um, I can tell you that on the college job side, we always encourage people to contact us. We have a variety of ways that we will work with people to help them get through short-term hardships and stay on their feet because it's certainly our goal. We don't want people to not be able to repay their loans. We want them to be successful. Um, and so it's, we want to work with people if they're having difficulty. Um, total cost of borrowing, this Debbie gets to your point about you, what we always find people are trying to do is balance monthly costs. So what can I put out the door today? But they don't want to pay any more than they have to in total. So you're balancing how much you can pay at any given time and trying to keep that total cost as long as you can or as low as you can, um, but in the constraints of your monthly budget. Um, so those are the two factors that you, you want to keep in mind. And we do offer a variety of calculators on our website that can help you make general estimates. Um, as well as very specific calculators for our products that feed, that that involve our product features. So there are a variety of tools there depending on you know what you're considering or what questions you're trying to answer. And just so people know, um, you know tonight to some on some degree, we this is um, a high level overview of some of these topics, particularly as it relates to the um, lending process or, and. We actually have another session scheduled at the beginning of June, which will go, we'll kind of review this, but even go deeper because, um, and we're gonna, the next slide is gonna talk about timing uh, because it's a little early. You're not gonna be able to apply for anything right now. You can start researching, you can start understanding. That's why we're doing this session tonight. But the beginning of June is when you'll probably really um, get you know down to business in terms of, of um, you know, understanding most likely by then the government will have the interest rates out on both the um, student direct loans and the parent plus loans. And um, if you're uh, you know, parents or family that are gonna borrow, you're gonna be uh, in the throes of starting to really um, apply or get pre-qualifications and, um, and, and we'll go into uh, a session with much more detail. Yes, yes, this is just the this is the preview of the June session and then we, we really will get into a lot of these topics in more detail. Timing wise, uh, really what I would be doing right now, if I were a senior parent, um, I would probably be looking around at who the lenders are, what are the different features that they offer, who lets you choose um, to make in school payments, who lets you choose how long you're going to take to repay the loan. Um, what other benefits do they offer? Do I care about cosigner release? I would be trying to line up in my head what type of benefits different lenders offer and what I think is going to be most important to me. You're probably a little early to start applying. Most people don't know exactly what they need to borrow yet. We tend to find that you do your um, research between call it now and, and through the June window. And then many people don't feel comfortable that they know what they need to borrow until they get the bill from the school. So we often see people wait until July-ish uh, when they actually have a bill in hand and then they have a much better sense of what they truly need to borrow. What, why it's important to shop ahead of that though is because the school often doesn't leave you a, a very large window between when they send you the bill and when the due date is. So you really want to shop ahead so that once you have that bill in hand and you know the amount you need, you already have a good sense of which lender or lenders you want to apply to so that you can get through that process quickly. You don't want to wait until July to do that shopping because they just don't give you very much time. Once you apply, the loan the application actually has to be sent to the school to certify the loan. So we talked about cost of attendance. We can't make the loan until the school echoes back to us that your student is enrolled and that the money that they're trying to borrow is within their cost of attendance. And then the, we have to go through the process of sending the money to the school because all student loans go through the school. They don't come direct to you or your student. Um, so if you keep that whole timeline in mind, do your early shopping now, figure out what matters to you, look at what different lenders are offering, know who your short list is and then decide whether you already think you know the amount or you need to wait until you get that bill for the amount. If you need to wait for the bill, as soon as you get the bill, start applying so that you can kickstart that process that does take some time. And Angela, um, isn't there like, if, um, if I were to apply for a loan, let's say 
now, even if maybe I'm too early, but um, that interest rate's only going to be valid for a certain amount of time. So that's another reason why you don't want to actually apply now until you actually you know what the dollar amount is that you're going to need. Yes, yeah, so you have 30 days to accept. You'll get your interest rate, and then you have 30 days to accept those terms. And there is some um, there is some movement that can happen in the loan amount after you apply, but you do want to have a pretty good sense of what you need before you apply. So again, we're going to go into more detail um, at the beginning of June about um, how you research loans, how you compare them. Um, but you know, tonight was just to start to give people the framework for you know federal loans. Parent plus loan, private loan, private parent loan. So you can start to think about what all your options are. Um, and just like in any major purchase or any time you have to borrow, um, we encourage people to shop around. You, you know, I can't actually, the uh, question that comes up the most at this time of year is um, where can I get the best interest rate? And you know what? I cannot tell you because I don't know your financial situation and I don't know how a lender will interpret your financial situation. So, um, you know, uh, so that's why each person has to go out and do this shopping. And again, we'll kind of go into more detail about this in June, but there's something about called pre-qualification. So you will get a, a sense of what a lender is going to offer you before they do a hard credit pull. Um, and, um, you know, I can't tell you which place to go to to get the best loan. I can tell you um, several lenders to check out, but then you're going to have to um, go be pre-qualified, get that, the, that interest rate range and make a decision. Yeah. There's a good question here, um, Angela, which you touched on in terms of the features, but maybe can be more specific. What happens um, if a borrower dies before a private loan is uh, repaid back? Yes, so that is one of the protections that most private student loans offer. I'm going to give my caveat of most. You should always double check with the lender, but it is reasonably common in the private student loan space. Um, the death or permanent disability of the student will forgive the loan. So we will we will write the loan off if there is death or permanent disability of the student. But what about the cosigner? Sorry. So usually if there's death or disability of the cosigner, um, the student is allowed to continue to repay the loan on their own. And if that affects their ability to repay, then we tell them to call us, but the, the loan is not automatically written off because the student is the one that received the utility of the degree and is still using that degree. But uh, if that changes their ability to pay, they should call us and we'll obviously work with them. There's another good question about um, parents with multiple students. Uh, Christy is asking, if I have a second child that starts school and my first child is in school, can I um, lump loans together um, if I need to take out loans for each child? No, you have to take the loans out. If you're, if, you're, if you're getting a student loan, if you decide to go for any a different type of loan product, I won't speak for that, but any student loan, you would need to take it out individually for the child. Um, Part of it is that if for any, re well, it's at an individual child, it's for an individual academic year or semester and at a specific school. So you can't combine student loans. And just to reiterate, there's another question about um, how often does somebody need to apply for a loan? And maybe you can just um, summarize Every again. Every year. For, for, for federal loans yes. and for private loans. Yes. Every year for federal and Generally, what people do is apply once a year for a private loan, but you could elect to borrow semester by semester for a private loan. So, but you, you I, just in your head, keep in mind that you are repeating it at least every year. And another good question is, um, even we know you, you have to do it every year. Do you have to do it in the fall? Can I do it at different times during the year? Uh, most people do it when the bill is coming due, but you can do it at any time of the year. And you can, for instance, maybe you decide you're not going to borrow when the fall bill is is due, but when the spring um, bill is due, you, you are going to borrow. Yes, and that applies yes. to federal or private. You can go back and you can take those load those That's loans right. then. That's right. The one limitation on federal, um, you you do have to be attending more than half time for the federal loan to be able to be applied to that semester. So the one caution I'll just give people is um, this often comes up for summer session. 
if the student is not enrolled at least half time, they can't use federal funds for that particular semester. So it does tend to hit either winter or summer sessions for people that sometimes that's a bit of a surprise and private can be the only option if the student is not enrolled at least half time. So um, there's a question, I don't know if you have advice or not, but um, uh, somebody's asking, do you have any advice for parents of twins having to finance and I guess, you know, borrow loans? You know, I think that one comes back to probably the earlier the planning, the better. Um, I, I think it does come down to early planning, honestly, because you are going to have to balance more um, at one time. So it's probably early planning and then early conversations with the kids so that they have the right expectations of what is going to be feasible. And you might, I guess, as a family with twins, look at um, who is, if you're going to borrow, who's mm -hmm. going to be the co-signer yes. um, and what their credit rating is how much they ultimately might be able to borrow. They may max out with two kids. And then, um, you know, um, who is the backup um, co-signer? And again, maybe it's both yes. parents. Maybe you might also have to go out to another um, credit worthy adult outside yes. just both parents. Um, okay, well, um, just another plug. If you guys want to um, enter in for the sweepstakes, um, please do. Uh, you know, it, it could be a fun way of getting uh, congratulations box of cookies for you and your students. Uh, so enter it in. We've been sending emails about it. it it's been on Facebook as well. Uh, and um, it runs through uh, May 15th. Um, and thank you. Oops all for coming tonight. Um, it, we've kind of gone to an hour and a half. Let me just tell you, I see a lot of really great questions here. Some are a little bit more detailed than, um, than we can go into tonight, but I am truly going to um, uh, download the chat and we will do an email to address some of the major questions because there's some good ones here, um, probably just not appropriate to go into detail right now. And then some will probably will go into detail um, at the beginning of June yes. when we come back. Um, and Everyone come back it. for June. Yes, well, particularly the parents of seniors. Yes. And I actually will encourage the parents of juniors, even though you might not have to do all the things we talk about at the beginning of the June, it's a really good education to understand what's coming down the pike for you. And then particularly understanding like borrowing limits or if you're gonna borrow, you know, how are you gonna spread it out over four years? And I, I would give kudos to the parents who can take this information and um, apply it to estimating your college costs before your student goes to college. I mean, that that is amazing. A lot of families don't do it, but the families, who do are really making smart decisions when it comes time um, for their students to both apply and choose where they go to college. Thank you, Angela. Thanks everybody. And um, we will see you again soon.